today um, we're continuing kind of in a hybrid of our, our, our series in Ephesians. Um, we've been talking about Ephesians for the last few weeks. I'm going to read a passage of scripture in a moment. Uh, but to do that, what is so interesting to me about the word of God, about especially about Paul, what he's doing all throughout his letters in the New Testament, is Paul is actually looking at situations and problems happening both in the church and also in the world around him, and then explaining how to live out of the gospel because of that. And so what we read when we read the epistles and the letters from Paul were actually seeing, hey, here's a problem in the church, like this dude is, is having an affair with his dad's wife, which is weird. I hope that's not a problem we have to address in our community. Um, but, and then he goes, in light of the gospel, this is how you should live. We even see it again in Galatians where Paul uh, calls out Peter out of all people and says, Peter, you're actually living out of step with the gospel and we need you to fix some things in light of what Jesus has done. So today we're actually going to look at what Paul has, to, what the Bible has to talk about in terms of race, ethnicity, culture, and how actually living out of the gospel calls us to live in light of those things. Paul talks about it, and um, our awesome Pastor Phil shared a great message on Friday that kind of alluded to this a little bit. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to read a little bit out of Ephesians. And then today we have five different speakers uh, who are all students who will be sharing today. It's going to be kind of a cool blast, like five-minute-ish TED Talk style where they're going to go one after another. I promise you, you're in for a treat. It's going to be open. It's going to be awesome. And I'm encouraging you to be open to what they're saying. When we talk about issues like race, it's really easy to get defensive or intense. And again, I need you to do this is take one more deep breath in, take one deep breath out. And today, as we speak on this, just want you to ask the simple question is how does the gospel call you and I to live in light of what Jesus has done? That's all we're looking at. What is Jesus? How do we live in light of what Jesus has done? So what we're going to do is I'm going to read from Ephesians. I'd like you to actually stand for the reading of God's word. And then we're going to invite our friends to be sharing today. Here we go. Here is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, and I believe we're starting at verse 13, I think is what we're going to do. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of its commandments, commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace, it might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God, would you help us to follow your son very, very well? Amen. Hope you guys enjoyed today. You may be seated. Christopher. Hi, guys. Wow. Oh, thanks, Alondra. Okay. My name is Danny Nye, and I'm here to talk for five minutes. Okay, I'm just going to dive in because it's a lot, and it's really important to me, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> ignorance is unacceptable in today's climate. There's no reason to not know about other cultures, religious beliefs, lifestyles, experiences. We have all of the access at our fingertips, and yet people claim knowledge and still choose to live in ignorance. It's our duty as Christians to love our brothers and sisters, but how can we do that if we don't understand them or even make an attempt to? So for those of you who don't know, I grew up overseas for 12 of my 19 years, um, most of which spent in Turkey. And when I came back to America, I did not like it. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, like, I, like America's great, but I didn't understand it, and so I didn't, understand how to love Americans or America. I had to work at it and I still have to work at it because it doesn't feel like home. And how am I expecting to understand my friends here or, or even just the way of life if I don't even try to immerse myself in it? So like, this is kind of a controversial thing to say, but I grew up 
as like a type of minority. I was the small portion of Americans in Turkey and the even smaller portion of Christians in Turkey. Um, so with that came a lot of feelings of smallness and feelings of isolation, but at the same time, it made me all the more eager to reach out to those around me. And it made me all the more eager to understand what was going on around me and to completely immerse myself in that culture. I didn't really have a choice. Um, and through doing that, I learned so much. The Turkish people taught me so much about life, faith, culture, community. And so all of my values come from this mixture of America, Turkey, different places I've traveled, and then the Christian culture mixed in with that. So, yeah, I was lucky to be able to experience these, and I know not everybody can travel or grow up overseas, but there are ways. You can literally just go out into Kirkland and find people of different cultures and talk to them and understand and try your best to see what their way of life is like. I've met Turkish people at Zoka like last week. Like, it's literally that easy. Um, just so you could better understand their backgrounds and the lives that they've lived, which are vastly different than yours. So I encourage you to step out of your circle, open your mind, and you can learn from people more about God and how to live a life according to God's word. I saw stronger faith in God and other cultures than I have in a lot of American churches. And I'm not saying that to diminish the like American Christians. I'm an American Christian but I'm trying to get you to understand that the body of Christ is so much larger than a country, than an ethnicity, than a class. There's just, there's no limit to the body of Christ. It knows no bounds. You can learn from other religions too. And I, I did that. Like, I was completely surrounded by Muslims all of the time. The call to prayer was going off five times a day. And there was a mosque on every corner. And... I learned so much about dedication in faith and discipline through how they practice. Committed Muslims will put in more effort than a lot of us do. And it's all the more heartbreaking because they don't know the truth. They pray five times a day, they attend mosque, they'll read scriptures in a language they don't understand all to seek out God. You can see the desperation in their eyes, but they don't know the truth. So that should just encourage you all the more to want to reach out, to want to understand them better so that you can access that piece of their heart that they have longing for God. Um, I think it's really easy for us to say that, like, we leave this up to missionaries and it's their job, and that's cool for them, but I don't have to do it. Um, but... It's not. In Matthew 28, there's the Great Commission. You know, God says to go out, make disciples of the nations. And that's not exclusive to missionaries. That's not something we can just ignore and put away. Yes, I know the argument is we need witnesses in our own communities. There's plenty of Americans who don't know God. True. We have all the resources, though. We have churches on every corner. We have, it's a economically developed country, we have access to internet, we have all of these resources, while there's places that have no access to the gospel. In Turkey, there are 87 million people and only four to 5,000 believers. That's one in 20,000 or 99.997% Muslim. That is unreached. Five years ago, there was this place we called the Zero Zone in Turkey, and it's the geographic area and size and population of Wisconsin. Five years ago, that we called it the Zero Zone because there were zero believers, churches, missionaries, Bibles. But today, because of hard work and commitment, there are signs of believers, several churches, and three church planting teams, and they just baptized someone more last month. So, yeah. But how can we call ourselves practicing Christians if we're willing to rest knowing there are millions of people without any access to Christ and knowing that we can be the difference there? It's easy to say that somebody else will do it, but that's what we're all saying. 
You don't have to be a missionary to step outside of yourself and learn from others or to spread the gospel to other cultures. It's your job. It's your calling. You have to follow it. Thanks. Bless everybody. Um, if you guys haven't met me yet, I'm Nathan Sanchez. I'm probably the most secluded known person on campus. I don't like getting out much, but um, I'm a pastoral ministry major here on campus. And I wanted to focus really on the particularities and culture within the Christian faith. So how do we see the different aspects of Christianity and say, oh, okay, these are the same thing. Um, I grew up in an AG background. I walked away from the faith. I came back at about age 16. And all I knew was the Assemblies of God. And so my whole perception of Christianity was, oh, okay, if the Assemblies of God is Christian, then everything else that is not box Assemblies of God is not Christian. They do things differently. They're weird. They believe different things. And so they're not Christian. We are. We're the one true Christian faith. That's not necessarily correct. <laughs> but I'm not sure if anyone else struggles with that belief. And I did for a time until I came and I experienced different things through missional experience and actually going out into the community. Uh, I'm just going to go into it. Um, let's just bow our heads real quick. Father, if your spirit can just prepare our hearts and minds as we dive into your word. Amen. So Acts 6 and 8, um, it talks about this preparing of the disciples to go out into the world. And so the main point is in verse 8, and it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We also have a similar passage in Matthew 28, where it says, what, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. We have this idea, if we're to make disciples of all nations, are they going to look the same? Do we come from America and I love America, I'm American. <laughs> if we come from America, do we make little us's in other countries when we're presenting the gospel? Or do we go to other sections of America, let's say the Northwest, and we go down to the South? Do we make little Northwest churches in the South? No. We look at the different aspects of their life and the different cultural diversity of their life, and we figure out how do we present the gospel to them in a way that they understand and they can merge it into their cultural setting. So, let's look at this story. There's, uh, if any of you have read the book, it's called Peace Child. It's in New Guinea tribe, and they're called the, let's see if I don't murder this, the Sawi. And so there's these people of cannibals, and they're also warring states. So, along the Amazon, a lot of the people there are considered warring, warring tribes because they like to fight. But this particular group of people, they had this idea that, while well, we believe that pride and like presentfulness and being on time is the most thing you can get, the highest achieving to be like, okay, man, you have respect. For them, how they attributed respect was trickery or deceitfulness or betrayal. That was their main aspect of honor. And so these missionaries, their name was Don and Carol Richardson. They go down there and they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to go convert the New Guineans, right? all excited, and they present the gospel, and they're starting in the beginning of the Bible. They work their way down, you know. God makes everything. He makes humans. Humans mess up. God's like, okay, I'm going to select some people. We got them, blah, 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 blah. We get down to Jesus, and then they get to the story of Jesus being betrayed by Judas. Now, what do you think happens? They start praising Judas rather than Jesus. So the missionary's first impression is, what the heck? <laughs> I'm from California as well, so my slang comes out sometimes. But they, they start seeing Judas as this, this superior person over Jesus. And it took a while for the missionary to actually immerse himself in the culture and understand how they view things, how they think, to understand how do I present the gospel. And it came at a time where they were warring with another tribe. And to break the war, the tribe that he was living in had to present the child of the elder, and give it to the other tribe as an offering. And does anyone have an idea 
of a child getting presented as an offering. Jesus. So he used that as the door to get the gospel in. He said the same way how you presented your child as an offering for redemption and for reconciliation between your two tribes, Jesus reconciled us with God by being presented as an offering to us. And so by the time we figure out, okay, well, we understand the culture now, now we can understand how to present the gospel. The way they understand the gospel, the way they see it, is not the same as we do. In America here, Northwest, one of the big things we focus on is freedom or rest in Jesus. Whereas if we go to other cultures, that's not their main focus. Their main focus isn't the freedom that Jesus provides. Maybe it's the provision. So we see the different cultural aspects, the particularities, and we have to figure out how do we present the gospel in a way that they can understand and they can grasp. When we present the gospel to people of different cultures, do we create different images of ourselves? Do we just go in saying, I'm going to make an image of myself or am I going to make an image of God? We allow the Holy Spirit to do his work by allowing ourselves to immerse in the culture and understand the way they think and the way they process. Not everyone is an image of America. Not everyone thinks the way we do. They think things differently. There's also stories of tribes where the chief will say, we as a tribe accept Jesus. Now, a lot of us would cringe, right? Because in America, it's a personal decision. Or is it? Is Christianity a personal decision or can it be a tribal decision where the chief says we accept Christianity and all the tribe accepts Christianity? And so I want to end with this. We must be willing to change the method in which we present the gospel. Willing to change the method but not willing to abandon the gospel message. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about five minutes. And the good thing about going as a third person is you kind of go segue off other people's stories. And um, how many have heard of the TED Talk called The Dangers of a Single Story? Raise your hand. Oh, that's so few of you. <laughs> okay, anyway, today I'm going to tell you about that TED Talk. I'm not going to present it as well as it has been by the author or the owner of that TED Talk. I'm going to talk to you about Chimamanda Adichie Ngozi. And I want you to say it with me. I know, it's a mouthful. Chimamanda. Can you So if you haven't seen that TED Talk, please go look at it. In that TED Talk, the author narrates how she grew up in a middle-class family in Nigeria and how she had so many different stereotypes of the people that she came across. She grew up as a kid of university, uh, university professors, and it was in a famous university. She got a chance to go to school. She got a chance to attend school and actually understand the Western novels that the professors would present to her. When she began to get creative and start writing stories as a, to- as a toddler, her characters usually ate apples and drank ginger beer. And this is in Nigeria. So it's, it's very ironical that that was the impression that she was having in her stories. But as she grew up, went to college, ending up to come to the U.S., she became aware of how stereotypical she had grown in her little box. And she took it upon herself to educate people about the dangers of a single story. In my talk today, I'll heavily refer to her story because I think It's really important for us to understand the dangers of a single story. You know, I was born in Kenya, and I came to the U.S. in 2014, and there were many times I've come across people that have stereotypes about Africa or Kenya in general. And sometimes I wish that people didn't assume Africa was a country. I wish that... I wish that people knew that we listened to Hillsong, Beyonce, (laughs) and my all-time favorite, Chris Tomlin. 
But guys, it's not only you. I had my own naive stereotypes. I thought that people in the US owned huge mansions. They owned really fancy cars. And there was no poverty. And I could go on and on about the different stereotypes that we had about each other. But that's not why I'm here today again. That would be another huge TED talk. But I'm going to talk to you about a story that we all should know, or we ought to know. And it's the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Understanding the story of Jesus is the most significant experience that anyone that wants to be like Jesus should understand. Understanding where it began, where Jesus was born, the experiences that he had growing up, it's important, it's crucial. It's, it's not only important to highlight the grace and salvation, it's relevant to highlight the pain, the relentless pursuit of Jesus to those who seek him. You cannot tell the story of Jesus without the story of the woman at the well or the good Samaritan, or how Jesus' human nature made him grapple completing what the Lord's will was for him. Or weep for losing Lazarus. Or Jesus kicking the people out of the temple. All these stories form one thing. And when you choose one and decide that's what the story that you're going to form and tell about Jesus, you're telling an incomplete story. And the dangers of telling an inc a stereotypical story is because they're not only wrong, but they are so incomplete there's a famous proverb in Africa that goes, until the lions can write, hunters will always tell their stories. And going back to my favorite author, Aditya, she says, show a people as one thing, and as only one thing, over and over again, and it is what they become. She continues to say that power determines how stories are told, when they are told, and how many are told. And that's why the successful hunt of a male lion that has the third strongest blow in the history of mammals will never be hard. Hunters will always say, I'm the strongest. I highlight this proverb because I want to indicate the power that we as Christians have when it comes to telling the story of Jesus. It is always going to be hard and interpreted depending on how we tell it. So it is up to you as a Christian that we understand how we tell the, the story of Jesus to people who have met him or have never met him. It is important to recognize our biases that have been ingrained by our faiths today. It has become very popular for one faith to determine how everyone's faith should be. It has become the new normal to dictate our experiences to people who don't think like us, who don't look like us, who don't see things like us. And at this point, I'd like us to think back to the things that Jesus did when he was hanging out with his disciples. Have we forgotten that Christ described the church as a body? Have we forgotten the roles that we all need to play for the body to be whole? Have we forgotten about the different gifts that we get in 2 Corinthians? My dear friends, I sometimes ask myself how important it was to put the different stories in the Bible. How it is relevant that we hear Lazarus, Zacchaeus, Paul, the woman who touched the helm of Jesus' government, and Lazarus' sisters. All the Old Testament, and we get to meet Abraham, Noah, David, Joseph, Job, etc., etc. And without all these stories, I think we would have an incomplete picture of how wide and diverse and integrative our faith is. Amen. So today, I would like you to challenge you. What are the stories that you've been telling about Jesus? What is that one single story that you've decided to focus on, and how open are you in knowing and becoming better. 
Actions need to speak louder than words today. Our faith needs to be just not a single story, but the wholesome story of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Hi guys, so my name is Jelsey, and I wanna start you all off by asking you all a question. You don't have to answer it. But what if we approached people with the attitude that they are an image bearer of God, just like how you're an image bearer of God? How would the way you treat them change? So I wanna read from Acts 6, verses one through seven. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Oh, my be from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So I wanted to point out that there were two cultural groups in this passage, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. And back in that day, to be a Hellenistic Jew meant you adopted the language and culture of Greece. And to be a Hebraic Jew meant you adopted more of the Jewish language and culture. And this is where the cultural conflict came into play. And naturally, being from two different groups, they didn't see eye to eye, and they approached each other with the ethnocentric perspective rather than an image-bearing perspective. And this is why the Hellenistic Jews and widows didn't get their daily distribution of food, and the nature of being a widow back then, you were already a marginalized and powerless group. So I want to ask this other question. When have our preconceived biases kept us from blessing, interacting, and are being blessed by someone of a different culture or ethnicity? Or when did we decide not to explore a different culture because we didn't understand their quote unquote weird customs? Or when did we assume we knew someone's story based off of what we saw? I don't mean to ask these questions to make anyone feel bad, but they're meant to be self-reflective so we can understand why we believe the things about certain people when we know nothing about them. And we have all been there. I have definitely been there. And if you haven't been there, then you are like the magic unicorn of society. And I literally want to know how you do that. So then with, keep, with this in mind, how do we operate out of an image-bearing lens? Well, in verse 3, they chose a council to deal with these issues. And there were two aspects of the council. One, they had to be filled with the spirit and of wisdom. In order for us to seek justice and fairness among issues such as racism and systematic oppression, we must first be seeking the Lord because without God's guidance, we, we, it's not going to be productive. And also we must be, the second aspect is we must know about these issues and be educated by them. The men chosen that were part of the council were also part of the group that said, hey, this is wrong. These widows need to be getting their daily distribution of food. And the same goes for issues of today that are very prominent. We need to know ha what's happening so we can deal with them accordingly. And so how do we do this? Well, honestly, a simple start is to engage with someone in conversation on, issue on people who are well-versed in these issues, but also someone who has a different opinion from you. The best way to diversify your perspective is to gain another opinion. And this also fosters growth as well. Also, be involved in organizations that advocate for diversity and multiculturalism. People in this group will help you on your journey in understanding issues of today. And a third way is doing your own research. We are all college students. We do this all the time. <laughs> and, and behind me should be a list of resources that we could do, like um, Kimani talked about the danger of a single story. That should be up there. Please have these be starting points. Do not let this be where you end. These are meant to keep the conversation going. And I say all this because we need to strive to be like the council who advocates for justice and fairness because God has given us this responsibility. Tackling issues like racism is uncomfortable, but uncomfortability should never be an excuse for us to not fulfill our given responsibilities. 
we are God's representatives on this earth and we must be good stewards of his children, all of his children. And it's already, it's already been mentioned, Matthew 28, 19. It's God's commandment for us to make disciples of all nations. God is for every white, black, and brown person in and out of this room. We must see each other through an image-bearing lens. This does not mean we ignore a certain aspect of a person, nor does it mean we only focus on one aspect of a person. It means we see who the person is holistically and engage with them anyways, despite our cultural human lens. Thank you. What's up, everybody? Hey. So um, my name is Kenan Baca. For those of you who don't know me, I am, in fact, Hispanic. Uh, you're like, who told him he was Hispanic? <laughs> like, that's the whitest Hispanic kid I've ever seen in my life. Poor guy, he's been lied to his whole life. Man, uh, so funny enough, I am actually, I did one of those DNA tests. Have, do you guys know those DNA tests that you, like, they do sales during Christmas time? So that was my Christmas gift because it went significantly um, on discount for, for Christmas. And so I got one of those, and I'm 60% a mixture of Mexican and, and Spanish, which explains the uh, blue eyes. Um, and so, and then the rest of it, it's a mixture of different European countries and stuff like that. But I'm a very good mix, but just enough to where I can say I'm Hispanic mostly, which I'm very proud to say. Actually, funny enough, Nathan and I are coming from the very similar place in California. Both of our parents are um, uh, in the Hispanic Assemblies of God of California. Um, we do it, yeah. Yeah, he's, the, he's my man. So, okay, I should actually probably get into this. I only have five minutes, so. Man, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to, to speak, and I just want to give a few thoughts to you today. Uh, I'm going to be reading out of Acts 2, uh, verses 44, 42 through 44, and it's kind of cool because I feel like we've been getting a little survey of Acts and even its applica how it's applicable to the um, topic of diversity and, and seeing our differences and all that good stuff. So this is a little bit farther on in Acts 2, and it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and check this out, it says, and they had all things in common. They were all together and they had all things in common. Now an interesting background to this uh, is that this was right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And at that time it was, it was the time of, um, it was a feast time where every single Hebrew community throughout the known world at the time, so all of the different Roman um, groups of the Hebrews, they came together. So that's why um, when they said, we hear these messages in our own languages, it's because they all spoke different languages. They were from different regions. It was as significant as like um, different continents to us at this point. It was basically the known world was coming together for this festival. And so when it says, and they had all things in common, it absolutely didn't mean that they were all the same. They didn't look the same, they didn't speak the same language. There were, there were very distinct differences in who they were. But the cool thing is, they now had the most significant common denominator that they could ever find. And that's how it kind of is with us, especially in Christ, is when we find out, man, we come together, we have different backgrounds, we have different socioeconomic statuses, our parents um, taught us different things. You know, maybe we're first, I know a lot of amazing first generation uh, naturalized citizens here to the United States. We all, have, we all have very different backgrounds. But when we come to Christ, that's the one thing that can kind of overcome all these differences that seem a little bit daunting. We hear a lot of the, the turmoil and all of these um, conflicts that are coming up around this issue, around the issue of diversity, how some of us don't get it, some of us are a little bit too maybe on one side or the other. And so it becomes this sort of uh, militant feeling. I, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit um, uneasy at times when I watch the news, when I hear different things going on. And, and the fact of the matter is all of the bad things really get the most press as well. And so we see these things and, and the question is, how can we overcome this? What, what, is, what can we do to kind of unify uh, together? And so what the, the church in Acts found was our hope today. 
It's our hope today, and it's that the one thing that matters, the one thing that ties us all together is Christ. He's the most unifying thing we could ever find. Now, the beautiful thing is they obviously they had different languages, but they heard it in their own language. So God doesn't come to take away our differences. Yeah. He doesn't come to erase the things that make us beautiful, make us different, the things that make us us. He didn't come to take away my background. He came to use it to, to push forward the gospel. He came to use it so that we can come together and the world can say, I haven't seen that anywhere else. I've not seen this many different kinds of people coming together in love and knowing each other deeply and taking the time like we were saying, to ask the hard questions, to talk about the tough things. I haven't seen this anywhere else. What is the difference? What do they have that we do not have? And we know that the answer is Jesus. He came. He, his blood was shed for this so that we no longer had to be coming against each other because that's our nature. That's our nature. But we've taken on a new nature in Christ. Excuse me, in Christ. Amen? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And so he did not come to take away our differences. He came to amplify them and to bring us together. And so, family, I want to encourage you today that lean into this. Lean into, into this idea that we all are different. We have some beautiful differences. But at the end of the day, it's not to have, have something to debate about. It's not to have something to, to bump heads about. But it's a testimony that this thing that we believe, that this thing that, that we have found, the salvation in Christ, the unifying factor of Jesus is absolutely real. He's absolutely powerful. The, an amazing point, really quick, is it says, and they all came together. They, they submitted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. So they, they devoted themselves to community, to spending time together, to eating together. And immediately after, it says, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being, being done by the apostles. So there's this uh, direct um, correlation between the breaking of bread and prayers, the community that they found, and the spirit continuing to break out. It's, so, it's such a cool thing. It says, and they devoted themselves, one more time, I'm sorry, I got two more minutes, so I'm going to take it. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were, de- were being done by the apostles. There's a direct correlation between community, the breaking of bread and prayers, and to the spirit breaking out in our lives. There's something powerful that happens in relationship. We talk about community so much. Uh, oh, man, I, I hope I don't get kicked off for this. We talk about community so much that I feel like it's starting to lose a little bit of meaning. It, it feels a little bit like, like, what does that even mean anymore? We talk about, com- we, it's, it's used in some ways. I'm like, I didn't even know it could be used in that way. Like, have some, have some good community. <laughs> Like, I, I've never heard that before, but um, it's, it's being said so much that, that I feel like it's kind of an ambiguous idea, but the, the fact of the matter is there's power in community, there's power in the simple breaking of bread and prayers together that we do. The spirit breaks out. See, I'm a hardcore, I tell you what, I'm a Pentecostal, and I love, I love the, the, man, I'll shock a Baba all day, but there's something about the breaking of bread and prayers that is so powerful. It is one, the, there's a something, I, I, I pray this with our... our our life group leaders, the people at my church, my worship team, there's something powerful about a smile. There's something powerful about asking someone, how's your day going, in a genuine way. The spirit moves through the little things, through, through relationship, and that's how we will become unified in such a tumultuous time, in such a time where it feels like we cannot find a common ground. Jesus is the most powerful common ground. Thank you so much. Thank you. We want to say thank you to everyone who shared. Um, Just thank you. Jesus said it, and he said that the world will know that you are my disciples. Why? By your love for one another. I don't think there's a greater apologetic to the gospel of Jesus Christ than the way that people operate in community who are different than one another. And that's what we're called to do in this community. And so um, we're going to do that, and we're going to work hard to do that well. Would you stand? We're going to grab the hand of the person next to you, and we're going to pray together. Yes, you are. Go ahead, even reach across the aisles. We're going to pray for one another, even if it's a stranger. And would you take about, like, we'll, we'll pray. We have, like, 30 seconds left. Why don't you just pray for the person on your left and on your right? Pray that God would make us this sort of community, and then uh, I'll close. Let's all pray out together. God, I pray that you would continue to help us at Northwest. Yeah, that's it, family. God, would you continue to unite us as a community?
Help us to love and follow and serve you well. God, help us to have hard conversations. Help us to sense your grace and your leading. God, we pray that you would give us great grace to love one another well, to love the different things about one another, to love ourselves as you do. God, in moments of uh, difference, in moments of difficulty, help us. We pray that you would give us your spirit to help us to live in community well. Give us great wisdom. And God, we commit as, as a people to follow your son faithfully and to do it in this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.